water exists in the air as its own gas. But I mean, how can air particles and water particles combine in the same space at the same time? They're so different. Wow, that's really weird. How is that possible? I don't know. Maybe evaporation is like the mixing of air and water particles. I mean, all particles must be of different sizes, making the gases different. I believe all matter is made up of atoms that are a solid sphere shape that can't be divided into smaller particles or pieces. But chemical reactions can be explained as the union and separation of atoms. When they react, the atoms combine in simple whole number ratios and sometimes even more than one simple whole number ratio. So technically, when the atom forms together with another atom, that there's a chemical compound, and then that's a gas or a solid or a liquid. Chemists through the ages have been trying to find out what makes up an element, and John Dalton first proposed that an element was made up of a small spheric atom that did not have any negative or positive charges necessarily and could not be split up. Throughout the following decades, chemists started to believe that an atom was much more than just a simple solid sphere, and scientists began to experiment with it and later developed the thought process that atoms were actually made up of much smaller particles. Chemists are actually still studying the atom today. Second stop, Cambridge, UK. J.J. Thompson, 1997, Plum Pudding Atomic Model Experiment. So in 1897, J.J. Thompson reasoned that the Plum Pudding Model had negatively charged particles, which he called electrons, because through his experiments, he zapped an atom of the plum pudding, and actually, electrons were removed from the atom. Thus, concluding that the atom must have some sort of nucleus. Stop number three is actually in Cambridge as well. Ernest Rutherford conducted one of his two experiments here in Cambridge. In 1911. Here we go. Notice how most of the particles are going through the tin foil, while very few are bouncing back. In this experiment conducted by Rutherford, he basically threw a tiny alpha particles and a piece of foil, and he discovered that most of them actually went through the foil, although some bounced back. Due to this, he assumed that the that atoms are made up of mostly empty space, and when they were bouncing back, it was actually hitting the nucleus, which he believed was solid. For Stob, Copenhagen, Denmark, where Niels Bohr conducted one of his experiments to figure out um, about the solar system model of the atom. In 1913. Here we go. Red. <laughs> Blue. Bohr concluded that because electron subshells have different energies, that when the um, electron passed through each subshell to get out of the atom, um, it gave out different lights or different colors of light depending on the subshell. And this would mean that the electron actually has subshells and has rings around it, um, which is how he created the idea of a solar system model with electrons at different 
distances away from the nucleus. So fourth stop, we're back in Cambridge, UK, where Rutherford made another contribution. This time, the proton model in 1918. He found he could use alpha particles as bullets to knock off small positively charged particles. He called these protons. In 1918, Rutherford conducted another experiment where he shot small alpha particles as bullets at a larger atom. The result of this experiment was that when he shot the alpha particles at the atom, small positively charged parts of the molecule came out. He concluded that the nucleus was not just made up of protons, but made up of protons and neutrons. Last stop, Munich, Germany, with Werner Heisenberg. He proposed the electron cloud model in 1927. Heisenberg's uncertainty theorem proposes that electrons do not follow a certain orbit around the nucleus, but rather they stay within a quantum energy level around the nucleus. This is called the cloud atomic model. This is the most recent atomic model experiment by Heisenberg. And we're back in Boston to examine the modern day theory of the atomic model. Are you ready to learn about the atom? So, the atom is basically comprised of four main parts. The proton, the neutron, the electron, and the electron domain. Any questions? Yes! What do the electrons, neutrons, protons do? So, the proton and the neutron, the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus of the atom, which is the very center of it. The protons are positively charged, and the neutrons carry no charge. The electrons, however, are around the nucleus, and they exist on the electron domain, which are the rings around the nucleus. The electrons actually have a negative charge. Do the electrons have a certain subshell? Because there are two rings around this. Yeah, there are actually multiple subshells. There's an S subshell, which is the very first subshell of a ring. And there's also the P, D, and F. Each subshell has a different amount of energy. The modern day atomic model is actually made up of basically two models that were used in the past. They were called the solar system model. Which was basically like this, except for the nucleus was thought to be a solid and was only positively charged and didn't contain any neutrons. This combined with another model, which was called the proton model, showed that the center actually had another element called neutrons. This led us to the modern day model, which encompassed the protons and neutrons in the, in the nucleus. It also shows how the atom is mostly filled with empty space. And the electron domain is the path which the electrons go around? Yeah. Okay. And this is a carbon atom, right? Yep. Six protons, six electrons, and this one, six neutrons. Great. Good work. In the modern day theory of the atomic model, there is something called quantum numbers. Quantum numbers are used to describe the orbits electrons are found in. Four quantum numbers for every electron in an atom. Each quantum number in an atom is completely different for each electron. The first quantum number is called the primary quantum number, and this is used to describe the energy level of an electron. The second quantum number is called the angular momentum number, and this is used to describe the shape of the orbit holding the electrons. The third quantum number is called the magnetic quantum number, and this is used to describe the position of the orbits holding the electrons. The last quantum number is called the spin quantum number, and this is used to, of course, describe the spin of the electron.